All right, let's start this thing. Welcome again. Um, you guys are in the Creative Mornings Philadelphia channel uh, with your host, Michelle Freeman. Michelle, say hi to everyone. Hey, good morning. And this is the rest of our volunteer, which is quite large, and everyone plays a, a very important role to make sure that this happens every month. So this is this is your team. A lot of them are on the call right now. Uh, Justin is going to introduce the topic of spectrum. As I unmute myself. Uh, so I actually, uh, I'm just going to read the prepared thing that they had for Spectrum because I think this was really good when we uh, discussed our host today. Uh, a lot of the times when we have uh, hosts, the, the relation to them, the theme is very literal. Um, but this, you know, Spectrum is sort of a broad theme and I was, you know, figuring out how we tie it to this month's speaker. Um, but uh, I think the description from Creative Mornings is pretty good. So I'm just going to read that. Uh, it says a band of colors, uh, expanding definitions, a broad array of identities. Uh, we all live within multiple spectrums, colliding and intersecting with one another. Like the diversity in our food, styles of music, and the skills we exercise, our needs are distinct with no one-size-fits-all solution. Understanding and champion championing, <laughs> championing other realities normalizes saying what I experience, feel, and notice may not be what you know to be true. Designed for the spectrum and not the means, said Michael Kaufman in his Creative Mornings talk. How do we move beyond courteous hospitality to create, create courageous inclu inclusive <laughs> inclusivity? Uh, as individuals committed to artfully living, we can paint refreshing possibilities that are not just for ourselves, but also for others. Assemble your tools, listen, look within, embrace the weird, and take the prism and flip it on its head. You'll likely find a breathtaking blend of opportunities to make a difference. So uh, our Las Vegas chapter chose this month's uh, theme of Spectrum, and I'm going to mess this up, but I think it's uh, Iandri Randri Mondroso uh, illustrated the theme. All right. Now I'm going to introduce a spectrum of sponsors. So uh, our first global sponsor is MailChimp. I think most people have interacted with MailChimp in some way. They're, a, they're our official global sponsor for marketing. And I actually just created a MailChimp uh, um, mailing list for my, my block called the Taylor Street Gazette and I send out information for the entire block. And MailChimp has created uh, a new series called Book Shook, which they do with Hello Sunshine. It's a series where powerful women discuss the, the books that move them, changing their lives just when they need most. Featuring Reese Witherspoon, Jamila Jamil, and Yara Shahidi. All three episodes are live now on MailChimp's virtual literary festival by the book. Uh, WordPress is our official global partner for web publishing. And they also have a series um, called Own Your Content. And <clears throat> for season three, uh, uh, Creative Mornings caught up with artist and educator Jen Hewitt, as well as company of one author, Paul Jarvis, as part of a special field trip series. Check out insights from these interviews and learn about overcoming per perfection, digital privacy, and finding your enough at ownyourcontent.wordpress.com. And Basecamp is the official global partner for project management. And our friends at Basecamp have recently launched a new product expanding beyond their project management tool. The new product is called Hey, and it's been carefully designed to fix the challenges we've all experienced <clears throat> with our email clients like Gmail and Outlook. Hey by Basecamp is packed to the brim with unique features you won't find in other email apps. Check out a tour of their favorites. Uh, hey.com slash features. So now to our local sponsors. 
uh, Honey Grow. Uh, I miss them so much because at our, all our live creative mornings, we would have honey bars and they would always supply us with ample amounts of, of goodness and coupons. And we don't have that anymore. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll go back one day and be greeted with deliciousness. Uh, our official coffee sponsor is Counterculture, so definitely check them out. Uh, it's amazing, and um, definitely throw them some support if you have a hankering for some great coffee. Uh, Box Theory is actually the all-purpose creative services company that Justin Geller and I run, and we pl proudly support Creative Mornings. And Andrew Gormley was our film and motion person who would film each Creative Mornings event. And uh, and he also has a Keanu Reeves podcast. So definitely check that out and we miss him. Steve Wynick is our fearless photographer. Uh, again, I wish we would see Steve every week like we used to, but hopefully one day. And if you're um, doing social today on uh, during the talk, definitely use the hashtag global hashtag uh, creative mornings and the local hashtag is CMPHL. So now, Justin, are you introducing Paul? I believe so, yeah. All right, so take it away. I'm gonna give you the quick Paul Farber abridged bio thing and then I'll talk a little bit more about him but I'll be quick because Paul has lots of important things to say. Uh, Paul Farber, PhD, is artistic director and co-founder of Monument Lab. He also serves as senior research scholar at the Center for Public Art and Space at the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weitzman School of Design. He's the author of A Wall of Our Own, an American History of the Berlin Wall. And he's also the co-editor with Ken Lum of Monument Lab Creative Speculations for Philadelphia, uh, which is a public art and history handbook designed to generate new critical ways of thinking about and building monuments. So if anyone uh, is not from Philadelphia or are from Philadelphia and you don't know about Monument Lab, uh, it originally started in 2015 as a pair of outdoor classrooms uh, in the courtyard of City Hall. And then there was a learning lab operated by students and educators, and they gathered uh, hundreds of public monument proposals. Uh, so that was like the birth of Monument Lab. And then in 2017, uh, Paul and Ken decided to just go crazy and they made this huge, they partnered with Mural Arts and made this huge citywide exhibition featuring temporary prototype monuments by 20 artists across 10 sites in Philadelphia. So uh, they were in the Philly public squares, neighborhood parks, and they all had uh, research labs where they uh, took in proposals for what people thought an appropriate monument would be for Philadelphia. Um, so full disclosure, I work with Paul at Monument Lab since 2017 and Paul works tirelessly to fight uh, against injustice and bigotry through his advocacy of public art and it's been truly inspirational to watch it. Um, uh, we were discussing this earlier uh, when we first went on the chat or went on the call this morning. Uh, monuments, especially in Philadelphia, there's tons of monuments everywhere and they're kind of these invisible things. You don't see them, you know, you walk by them every you don't notice, you don't even know what they are. Um, but uh, they carry a lot of meaning and a lot of power, and especially to people who the monuments were designed to intimidate and oppress in many occasions. Uh, so watching Monument Lab projects inspire people uh, and neighborhoods uh, with the possibility of something that represents them has been a really amazing thing to witness, to people see, you know, finally can see a monument as something that truly reflects who they are. Um, so it's been really exciting to watch. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Paul and he can tell you all about his amazing work. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Is it just starting? We're just starting now. Can everyone, um, can everyone see all right? I think it should say creative mornings and not be my scattered desktop. All set. All set. So I just, I want to thank everybody for being here and especially the creative mornings crew. Um, you know, for years I've, I've kind of um, taken in 
this amazing array of speakers, but also collaborators who make it possible. Um, and though we're not able to gather together um, with our cups of coffee, um, just being able to hold space with, with all of you in Philly and well beyond um, in uh, New York and Indiana uh, and elsewhere is really um, a treat. Um, you know, today, uh, the topic is spectrum. And, and for me, a really important word that I've been thinking about through this, but also kind of more broadly is the word convergence. Um, and I think with that, the word collision, because, you know, we're living through a moment of multiple convergences um, and a kind of reckoning that has been a long time coming, um, especially around systemic racism um, and other forms of injustice. So, you know, I, I think, um, I don't know, in addition to the experience of time, which is quite warped right now, because we're not always clear, not just what day of the week we're in, but kind of what year or which period we're living through. So I think of the kind of convergence around a um, few ways. One is that, you know, we're living in a moment where we're no longer delaying what we know a more just world should be. Following the lead of artists, of activists, of visionary thinkers, not settling for a status quo and dismantling everyday forms of American apartheid and pushing that as a reality, both symbolically in public spaces, but also in our systems. Um, but then of course, I, I um, you know, note that you know, we're living through also a period of, of profound repression. Um, this is the week when um, the uh, police officers who killed Breonna Taylor um, while she was in her own apartment weren't charged, um, where uh, we hit the mark of over 200,000 Americans who died in the pandemic because of a lack of uh, a, a true public health and federal response. And so this is a lot to hold for everybody. Um, this is a lot to hold on a big picture level, on an everyday level and a kind of face to face. So what I wanna do today is, is think about the kind of convergences around coping uh, and also how we are hoping, how we are trying to hold space for our grief that's real and respect that and also try to have uh, parts for imagination and grace and pushing forward. And I feel like the, the two words for me when it comes to this convergence is urgency and grace. Um, and in order to imagine a different future, um, for me, I work in monuments, I'm a historian and a curator and I always think about the way to get to the future is really to know your past. And so I, um, you know, I think of this quote from Walter Benjamin, a, a German Jewish um, writer who says, memory is not an instrument for surveying the past, but it's theater, it's the medium of past experience, just as the earth is the medium in which dead cities lie buried. He or they who seek to approach their own buried past must conduct themselves like a person digging. And so I think a lot of this work, when we think about what are our most creative tools, what are our most critical tools, is to figure out our relationship to the people that we work with and our own knowledge of self. Um, and I'm interested in that, again, in the field of history and art, um, but I turn to you know, the late poet laureate, I'm sorry, Nobel laureate, um, writer Toni Morrison, who said on the basis of some information and a little bit of guesswork, you journey to a site to see what remains were left behind and to reconstruct the world that these remains imply. You know, sometimes when we think about history, there is a way that history is, equals the past. And that's not quite what it is. It's history is the stories that have been told, the stories that have been elevated. Um, and of course, along with that, the way that history is used as a force to shape the present. As a historian, I'm, I'm interested in kind of knowing the, the facts and the, the timelines of, of the past, but I'm much more interested in how we remember, how we gain traces of the past, um, how we transfer it, how we value it, how we bring it forward, and what gets, um, what gets held up and what gets lost in the process. And perhaps that's a way to think about American history, not as static, but as moving. Um, of course, this summer, um, if you went to any news source, you'd see these headlines of Confederate monuments um, being taken down amidst the uprisings um, against systemic racism and in defense of Black lives. Um, of course, I just want to note, you know, I think it's really fascinating that many of the kind of 
prominent headlines and lead images were of monuments being toppled and torn down. Um, but the large majority of monuments um, that reflected can the Confederacy lost cause to um, systemic racism, to colonialism, um, were taken down by local decree, um, by small kind of um, public art agencies and state agencies. And so really the work is how to connect symbols and systems of justice and injustice, and also to be thinking about how we respond. What do we do in our everyday? Because it can feel really heavy. I mean, if you've ever tried to build a monument or take one down or even wrestle with one, um, even intellectually, like it's a lot to handle because they have, they're not permanent, but they have the aura of permanence. And so here's what I wanna do for, for this morning um, because it's a really um, important time to gather, but also under the, the auspices of creativity. Um, so here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna share with you some of the ways I've been processing this summer um, by reading a few pages of what I hope will be um, uh, a next book. Um, and it's taken me from Philadelphia to Richmond and to Monument Avenue. I'll, I'll try to read from that um, for you. You get an early sample. Um, and then I'm gonna go dig a little bit deeper and I'll go to some of the origins of Monument Lab and the origins of my work and try to end us at a point of what comes next. And what comes next is a little bit about what's happened in the past and what's coming forward. You ready? We're here? This is the moment in the room where like I would do this, get our coffee and go, let's make it happen. I went to Richmond to see the fall of the Confederacy again. Traveling from my home in Philadelphia, I drove south on I-95 across the historic Mason-Dixon line, down the Beltway and past Washington, D.C., arriving in Richmond as the city was in the midst of removing another one of its dozens of symbols dedicated to the Confederate lost cause. Like tornado-chasing scientists who hear the cracks and claps of severe weather and proceed to the edge of a storm, calibrating the right distance to observe without being subsumed by the force of a funnel cloud, my job as a monument historian and a part of Monument Lab is to find a way to both witness and lean into the gale force gusts of historical change. That day in the, in the first week of July, 2020, in the sum, summer simmering with the heat of reckoning over inherited statues and systemic racism, I stepped onto the long grassy median of the city's Monument Avenue, ground zero of an American culture war. Right ahead of me, I caught a glimpse of the colossal monument dedicated to Confederate General Robert E. Lee. The pedestal was the first part of the landmark to come into view. From 1890 forward, the Lee statue marked a cornerstone of Monument Avenue's historic district, a tony mile and a half long corridor built by postbellum white real estate developers who installed larger than life Confederate figures to embody their vision for a segregated neighborhood. But that day in July, Monument, Avenue, Monument Avenue's hold on local history in the former capital of the Confederacy was already in flux. I arrived a day after a new Virginia state law took effect that local municipalities could decide the fate of their own Confederate statues, a reversal of a previous statewide limitation. The city of Richmond wasted no time plucking away several Confederate statues on Monument Avenue, including this one previously to Stonewall Jackson, with another torn down by protesters several weeks earlier. City officials waited word from the state of Virginia to follow through on the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue. And meanwhile, artists and activists refashioned the city's monumental landscape through their own visions, guided by the drive for new stories and new possibilities to emerge. I walked toward the Lee Monument and its surrounding traffic circle, and the area was marked off by concrete barriers. I looked over to my right and read a large wooden sign designating the space under a new name, Marcus David Peters Circle. While Lee Circle still existed on official maps, the space was renamed a month earlier by Richmond activists in memory of a local black teacher shot by police in 2018. Since early June, in the midst of the sweeping uprisings and protest movement in defense of black lives, this traffic circle was repurposed and taken over by anti-racist grassroots coalitions. At the edge of the circle, a makeshift people's library, voter registration table, a basketball hoop, and a water ice stand, yes, a water ice stand, Philly people, um, were part of a set of resources 
watched over by a group of self-appointed stewards who held watch over this transitional space. Once inside the enclosed circle and looking from the ground up, I could see the details of the Lee statue and its transformed pedestal that had already made international headlines. The 60 foot tall, once white and pristine marble base was covered with bright splashes of red and yellow paint, layered with a rainbow of phrases wrapping the monument like a Christo. On that day, the graffitied messages on the pedestal appeared in spots as big as billboard fonts and on the scale as intimate as a love letter. Before reaching the pedestal, visitors would be met by a circle of handcrafted memorials to black people killed by law enforcement from around the United States, including George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, and Rakia Boyd. I took a moment to pause, bend down, and pay respect. And when I stood up and to greet the monument at eye level, I saw a pair of tomato plants sitting in blue plastic pots on the elevated level of the pedestal next to a half-finished game of Jenga. From here, the Lee statue perched high above, splattered with paint, its pedestal a canvas for racial justice, covered from its base to its summit, and it appeared as more of a holdout than a crowning symbol as it had on the Monument Avenue. I took in this scene as an observer, a historian, and a member of a growing movement of monument change agents through my work as a co-founder of Monument Lab. As one of the nation's leading public art and history advocates and experimenters over the last decade, we as a team have worked around the country with activists, artists, and local municipal leaders to unearth the next generation of monuments through stories of social justice. Conventional thinking used to be that monuments were permanent, universal, untouchable, and just above us. Statues seemed timeless and static, and as symbols of power, they most often stood in for history as an interpretation rather than mirroring something pure. In actuality, no monument is permanent. They require maintenance and mindsets to keep them in place. Fooling our sensibilities, we must be reminded that monuments rise, fall, and evolve over time. If you have the time, money, and power to build a monument, you do. And if you don't have the time, money, or power, you gather next to a monument to claim your place in public space. In Richmond, as I witnessed Monument Avenue in the throes of transformation, I came face to face with my country ensnared in a centuries old battle over the telling and living of its own history, facing the contentious writing of its next chapter. No longer would the Lee Monument ever stand, let alone be imagined without the story that people powered anti-racist art and activism was too part of this place's history. I was reminded of the revelation that drives my life's work. Monuments are made to change. So that was a sample of, of what's coming. So I'll appreciate um, the wordsmiths that can help um, push that forward. Um, Goes in tight. So that was this summer, and I just want to say, you know, part of the experience of this summer um, was understanding what was novel about this moment. And part of it was understanding that there were tremors along the way, ways to understand that monument debate is nothing new. Um, the monument debate started as soon as many of the Confederate monuments that, that dot the American landscape went up. I mean, I think back and taught my students recently the stories of Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois, leading black scholars and activists who um, contested the monuments in writing, um, you know, uh, nearly a hundred years ago. Um, but I also think about this moment as kind of how to, how to find a place in, like how Monument Lab started and how to take on something as big as monuments or as big as history. And Monument Lab really started in the classroom. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. I moved away for 10 years um, to do a PhD in American studies. And when I came back, um, I met Ken Lum, uh, an artist and curator who was new to the city um, and connected with um, folks like Lori Allen, a researcher and, and activist, William Hodgson, um, a designer, um, ongoingly folks like Sue Mobley, from New Orleans and this kind of circle got bigger and keeps getting bigger. Um, and for Monument Lab, when we think about monuments, we've come to this definition that monuments are statements of power and presence in public. 
because we've seen that monuments that are bronze and marble that kind of hold important space. That's part of what we say when we may monument, but we know poems, we know music, we know activism that has made an important imprint on our public spaces. And so we wanna make room for both of those uh, kind of senses of definition as a way, again, to fuel around this idea that monuments are made to change. And from wherever your perspective may be, you have a way to elevate your voice. I was trying to dig back into when I first became interested in monuments. I couldn't find the moment, but I did find this picture and it was important, I guess, to pull it up here um, to talk about a long process. I didn't know then um, what I know now, but um, here exploring a national park site um, in, the, in the desert Southwest. I guess I thought about the past in a few different ways. One, you can tell from my matching sweatsuit that dinosaurs, like most kids, occupy a kind of mythic place of the past. Um, even though I'm here, you know, in, in the American West land that was settled um, uh, over uh, indigenous communities, right? So even from an early age, I say, like there's a joy and connection with history, but there are certain stories that we receive over others. Um, and in fact, on this vacation in the early eighties, uh, we did visit a, a Native American reservation and kind of, I didn't know then, but this early convergence is in layers of history. Um, you know, I'm Jewish, I'm queer and I'm white. I have entangled identities like all of us here. Um, but truthfully, um, I, over time and even now, even after years of writing and teaching about identity, um, I, I'm understanding differently what it means to think about history from those multiple standpoints. Because I think I've been communicated and, and kind of come up with and entered into stories about the past um, and what it means to be not just see yourself represented or not see yourself represented account for profound loss or the chapters of American history, but to think about safety, right? Like the, the idea that we have monuments that are better protected than um, communities uh, in, in Philadelphia and anywhere else in this country just reminds us again, like how deep this goes. So I, you know, one of the things I put out there and plant a seed is asking all of you, how did you learn to remember? Where did you learn history? Was it in a book? Was it walking by your house? What was spoken about and not spoken about? And I think part of the process of kind of confronting the ways that we've learned history as a way to air them out is all about coalition. And so I think that, you know, while I spent a lot of time in books and archives, I, I want to call out the different kinds of coalitions, conversations, friendships. Um, here are two examples of two figures who have been really important to me. Lori Allen, who's one of the uh, co-founders of Monument Lab and is a librarian, and, and my friend and mentor, Salome Shatillet. And these kind of experiences, like where um, I'm reminded that uh, of a quote that the, the scholar Joseph Roach said, that um, historians shouldn't abandon the archives altogether, but spending more time in the street uh, is an important kind of pathway to knowledge. You know, the work of curating and the work of being a historian, being an artist, always involves relationships. You move at the speed of trust, you build. And I think about those kind of connections. So um, here's an image um, in uh, 2017 um, with uh, local poet and profound muse Ursula Rucker, um, Nigerian artist Emeka Ogba, and of course I'd be remiss um, to not mention the presence of Justin Geller of the Creative Mornings team, because this is his studio where we recorded um, the Ode to Philly, an epic poem by Ursula Rucker, um, produced by Justin. And kind of taking these moments of coalition building um, and how they spill out in the public square and seeing here in September of 2017, Ursula Rucker performing Ode to Philly um, in the courtyard of City Hall and adding to these layers of what it means to understand the city. Um, she does it from not just any pedestal, but the, the pedestal that Mel Chin designed um, for Monument Lab 2017. And, and I think I just want to highlight again this kind of process of learning and unlearning, the process of digging through your own history and kind of revealing layers of public spaces. Um, I work with an amazing team of people who want to, um, however they can, add stories to public spaces, reveal layers that have not been told and just also shine a light in a new way to say that these are not hidden histories or hidden stories. And we're talking about in Philadelphia, for example, the narratives of abolition, 
um, of the Underground Railroad, of stories of struggle. They're there. They just might, you might need to change your perspective to understand how they've lived in the city um, for some time. Um, I also think about this question of accessibility um, and how do we bring that close to us. Um, here's just another image from Melchin's work in 2017. He installed two identical seven foot tall um, monument pedestals that were next to one another. They each had 90 feet of ADA accessible ramp behind them so anyone could go up. Um, and people did here in wheelchair um, before the safety glass was up. You know, it's Philly. So um, people doing wheelies up the, the ramp also flew off. But that's the way the city is. Um, and we love the city for it. I um, mean, here, just a shout out to my parents who are down below, waving up to one of the um, uh, project producers, um, mothers who went to the top of the, the monument um, in a wheelchair. So access is important. And I just bring up this project just for a moment before pivoting to kind of the final part of the presentation, because in the process of making this work, and I always say this, process matters as much as outcome. We were told that this was allowed to happen. There's a whole story we could get into, um, but we at first thought about stairs and it was our um, uh, exhibitions director, Matthew Callan, who said, no, you got to put ramps behind this and you have to fight for them because at every stage people will tell you you don't need them. And those people who will tell you are people who don't think about ramps, either because of their own mobility or they're not pushing strollers or they're not thinking about it in that way. And so the monument actually didn't take up that much space. It was the ramps that took up the majority of the courtyard. And I think just think of that as the physical manifestation of access and opportunity and equity. Sometimes we just see the end point and how do we as creative thinkers, as producers who are always worried and concerned and rightfully so about the final product, the polish, what gets put out, how do we reveal layers of process that are opportunities to reckon with justice, to create opportunities for fairness and access along the way? Going back and digging deeper, this was the first project the Monument Lab ever worked on in 2015 from the late artist Terry Adkins. We started then a process we do in every project. We ask a question that we want as many people to answer. Sometimes we come up with a thesis at the end or an epiphany, but it's a lot of times about the question where there is not one answer. We actually want to know the answer, but we want to hear a multitude of responses. And the answer for what's an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia, how we started our work. Terry said it was a classroom. Philadelphia is known for innovation, but in 2012, we were known for a wave of school closures and budget cuts disproportionately affecting black and brown communities. And this sculpture was not meant to be on high and untouched. It was meant to be a crossing place. It wasn't a monument because it was permanent. It was a monument because it was right in the heart of our city hall where 180,000 people um, on a pre-pandemic day would, would pass within five minutes of it. This structure changed my purpose and my path. I thought I would train my students, lean back, wax philosophically and write about it. It pulled me in and pulled me in in some ways that were profound that allowed for Monument Lab to keep going. Every day there would be a new surprise and in Philadelphia, you never know who's going to show up. Um, but just thinking about like, when you're outside, when you're in public space, and you're thinking about public space, and you invite other people to be a part of that process, um, there's always these built-in moments to, <laughs> to actually both dive in and take a step back. Deep at the heart of Monument Lab's work, again, is about process and product. And you know, I think about um, like the before and after, or the kind of different sides of curating. And on the right side is that moment where you polish, where you put forward, where um, in this case, um, I'm sharing it with you now, like I had 10 minutes before the opening, like a lot of folks probably identify with here and went into the bathroom and like tucked in my shirt and, and um, spit shine my hair. But most days when I'm working, it's more the picture on the left um, where I am like holding a pretzel because I didn't have time to eat. Um, I am on the phone with either like a city official or an artist, or maybe uh, like it's my mother calling to just check, making sure I've eaten, um, and schlepping around the things that hold the project together. And I, I feel like I just, I was looking back for this talk and thinking of these two sides, and it's all part of it, right? Um, and so how do we make room for one another's process? I think the, the time of the pandemic with Zoom, we've, I've seen my colleagues be so much more understanding 
of the interruptions, which are actually our life, our uh, kids, puppies, other things going on in the background. And so like, how do we make room, we cheer on the, the polish, and we also respect the process and the grit. Again, at the heart of Monument Lab's work is speculation, is inviting people to share their ideas, to count the ideas that they've shared and enter them into municipal data. To imagine that like the information that we have, not just what's written on a plaque or elevated on a pedestal, but the everyday statistics of a city, what people believe, what crime is, what education is, what equity is, how do we put our fingerprints back on that data? And so what part of the art of Monument Lab is building prototype monuments and gathering new forms of data that are all about education and civic engagement. And this process of asking questions to as many people as we could in 2017 revealed a data set of close to 5,000 proposals. Um, you can dive into them at proposals.monumentlab.com and I invite you to do so. They're kind of like a rabbit hole. Every single one is worthy of some kind of deeper reflection, but the project as a whole, the data set as a whole, just revealed to us really powerful things and kind of added nourishment for the work that we do. And I think, again, to be clear, we're, we're not in a moment where we don't have the imagination. We need to support that imagination and build processes that can actually incorporate that into our everyday, into our process and our outcomes. Um, the way that Monument Lab works is producing, at the end of our process, um, reports. And, and just to be clear, no one in the city asks for the report in the beginning. Um, but once you say we're making a report, that's when the mayor's office started saying like, okay, um, we'd love to see it. And we made a report to the city for the city of Philadelphia. We delivered it to every municipal office, to every public library branch. But um, we also, and we delivered it to the mayor and all of the city's A-team, which is all of the commissioners who have a font like the TV show, the A-team on their PowerPoint slides. But, you know, I think this, what was powerful for us is when we, we did this, we speaking to Philly, and we started hearing from our colleagues and friends in other cities who said that this was speaking to them as well. Philadelphia, long known as a capital of public art, we wanted to see for ourselves as we started thinking about working in other cities to be rooted in Philadelphia with the same spirit of a push to make our city more democratic and think about art as the portal for change. These are glimpses of the report. You can uh, still get them. I have some of the newspapers. Um, if you want, we're happy to send you a copy. You can see this all online. But just trying to, again, rethink not just what you see on the pedestal, but how we even understand why a monument is powerful. So as we move forward, our work includes still building prototype monuments with artists in public spaces, like the artist Karen Olivier, who covered the Revolutionary War Monument in Germantown with a mirror or here a project we did in Newark, New Jersey last year, a call to peace with New Arts Justice, where the artist Manuel Acevedo covered this monument called Wars of America, made by the same sculptor, Gudson Borglum, who made Mount Rushmore and designed Confederate Stone Mountain and covered it um, and climbed it as a way to study it in process. Um, to do participatory research, we worked in the city of St. Louis with the Pulitzer Foundation um, to ask how people would map the monuments of St. Louis. And of course, when you do that, like the Liberty Bell in Philly, the arch was the most cited monument, but fewer than half of the nearly 1,000 people that we spoke to um, included the arch on their map at all. They focused on sites that had been demolished, uh, sites that hadn't even been built yet. That's how they interpreted the question. Um, and you can actually see our research publication is not a white paper, but it's a foldable map. Um, that we can also, you can get a free copy from the Pulitzer or from us because we wanted to have a map of the past, present, and future together. Um, so I think about when I said traces and remembering, books are really important. For my work as a historian, as a curator, as an artist, I try to think now about the book not as the end point, but as the beginning, as a stepping stone, as a connecting point, as a way to gather people and stories together. And so how do we think about the high integrity, long time projects that we do need to put years of work in as a form of reflection? And then how do we think about urgency and balancing? 
also in these moments which are tough, which are trying, how do we have moments of sweetness? Like our book party where we had our gritty cake um, that we also find joy. And I think that's one of the lessons that I got from going to Richmond as well, that in a space of reckoning, a space of confronting systemic racism, um, witnessing joy as part of the equation, as part of the tactics, as part of the brilliance and also of the sacrifice to make spaces of joy is incredibly important. So I close on some final notes um, of things that Monument Lab is doing both um, to invite you into it and to just, again, no matter what project you're working on or where you're based, how to get engaged in the moment. Um, we partnered with planyourvote.org um, where artists from around the country, um, around the continent, um, gave artworks. So this was a proposal that we had given um, to organizers in Richmond a few years ago before the Stonewall Jackson monument was removed. We thought, why, if, if you're not gonna be able to remove the monuments, why don't you show all the figures in a state of suspension um, in the process of coming down? Um, and so this has been utilized as a, as a kind of a reminder for folks to plan their vote. Um, we did a, a feature with Vice News recently um, where um, it was in honor of a project that we took on over July 4th weekend after a certain presidential uh, executive order about monuments, um, treating monuments as static, treating monuments as sites to repress free speech. Um, we revised that order and said that we actually need a full reckoning with our country's history and any conversation about monuments that doesn't take on the dual pandemic dual pandemics of coronavirus and systemic racism is just a distraction. And so we did a piece um, that you can see on YouTube. Um, I'm not reading the comments, but you can. And then of course, other ways to bring monuments to the scale of our every day. Um, and we've been partnering um, with artists throughout our work and we tried to kind of follow suit and be inspired by Ursula Rucker's statement that uh, we are our own monuments and our Monument Lab store is a great place to get merch. It supports our work. And also we're partnering with artists like Ursula Rucker and Michelle Angela Ortiz who get um, proceeds and profits from this. And um, you know, this has been amazing for us to see because we are, you know, we, we, are, um, we have a big reach, but we're actually pretty small. We've never had a full-time employee yet. We all are trying to move from a passion project to, to be more of a kind of uh, institutional force. And this is one of the ways we do that. So I want to close here in a moment um, and just invite everybody. Our annual conference is going to be virtual. It's called Shaping the Past this year, and it's the first um, full week of October. It's free. It's online. And we partnered with a number of places, including the German government and the Goethe Institute. Um, you'll see videos of our, our transnational fellows who have been making changes around the country and beyond in how we make monuments um, and special dialogues. I'll close here for conversation. Thank you for this opportunity to kind of walk through the creative process. And as you note, as I said in the beginning, I wanted to dig. So rather than, than um, going in a linear order, I wanted to kind of uh, explore the process um, uh, in a new way. So thank you and uh, let's talk. Wow, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about and a lot of wonderful things to look at as well. Uh, we have about 10 and a half minutes left for Q&A, so let's get going. Who's got a question? You can either unmute yourself or if you're shy, you can type your question in the chat and I will read it. A lot, a lot to digest. Lots of thanks are coming in, in the chat. Gratitude. I could only see one face while I was talking. Avery, that was a lot to put on you, but thank you for the affirmation along the way. And now I'm seeing other forms of affirmation, so thank you for that and, and great questions. Sure. Do you, I'll, I'll start with a question, Paul. Do you have a favorite monument in Philadelphia currently or, or one that you envision appearing in Philadelphia in the near future? I wanna echo what a, a number of people have said that the Octavius Caddo uh, monument that went in in 2017 
it's of course um, celebrating a figure who's long overdue for a monument, um, 19th century freedom fighter and educator Octavius Cato. Um, I think it's such an amazing, um, amazing structure in part because it didn't take a monument for him to be remembered. He's been remembered by members of, of um, the educational community, activist community, black historians, hist uh, historical societies. Um, there's an amazing book about him. But once the monument went in, it was the way people worked with it, where it was a site where people protested, a site where people went to reflect. There's a man um, named Bob who would dress up in period garb and hand out photos of, of Octavius Caddo. So it's just, I love that. I love seeing activity. Um, I'd also say the Art Museum steps right now, or the Rocky steps, it's a site um, this summer of dozens of protests, of creative actions. And it's just a reminder that no matter how heavy the space is or how official it looks, people add their own imprints to it. Thank you so much. We have uh, a question from Rachel about how's the current reckoning of racial inequity made you reevaluate, uh, Paul, how you write and how you frame history as a white person uh, in a position of leadership? And what are the most important pieces of making Monument Labs process inclusive? Yeah, absolutely. That, that process, no matter whether you started it decades ago or you started it this summer, um, it's always something to be thinking about. Um, you know, Monument Lab is a, is a multiracial collective. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of the projects that we do, um, you know, we work with um, a, a lot of collaborators um, who are working in the fields of anti-racism and, and, you know, are some of the most important um, figures in their work. That being said, a lot of times I'm out front speaking. And so what I have to think about in different settings is the different audiences I'm speaking to at the same time. So um, I think what I, what some of what I shared in the talk, uh, you know, is kind of wrestling with my own identities um, and thinking about moments um, as a white person where talking about racism um, or even kind of acting in, in civic space, like it's very white to um, speak and kind of find a plan and address it. And it's very white to sit back and be neutral so to speak, and do nothing. And so that's just a process, a push and pull that I try to work with on an everyday basis um, is understanding um, that. And, then, and so the, the other thing I'll just say, um, and something that I, I really like appreciated from the Monument Lab team when we, we talked um, this summer um, is, you know, rather than trying to rush to put out a statement, let's rush to kind of look within and let's look at our budget and let's look at the way we spend money, um, even as a kind of small, basically startup organization, how do we invest um, our money before we make a statement out? So anyway, there, there's a number of things there and it's, it's always a good question because you always have to be thinking about it. And it's, it's one that takes a lifetime to address, but every day you do little bits as well. Thank you. Uh, is there a, a certain specific place or neighborhood in Philadelphia where you would like to see more monuments? And how do, how do cities make those decisions? Yeah, I think that, well, first of all, I would say, I, I'm just going to claim a both end because I'm, I don't have to make them happen. I think um, it's important for a city center, um, especially like Philadelphia, where there's a notion that there's so much history everywhere, and yet that history um, it is largely incomplete. It's a small slice of what actually has gone on in the city. Um, so I want to see that um, bolstered and added and layered to. But, you know, neighborhood history is so important. When we've done work, um, you know, with our labs and, and neighborhoods, neighborhoods are not monolithic and neighborhoods are not static. Um, the neighborhood often self is a living monument. And I think when you think about the neighborhood, you think about different scale. You don't have to, like you don't have to have monuments that are larger than life that intimidate you. You can have monuments at the level of a storefront, monument at the level of a row house, monument at the level of a plaque, and it's a way for you to understand not just what came before you, but what your responsibility is. Um, and I think 
allowing for different kinds of monuments. What if we said that, like, I know we, we can catch this in public art or even in museums, like there's permanent art. There is nothing, there's no permanent art. None of us are permanent. So what if we want to, what is the word that we use and what is the process we'd use if not permanent? We'd say lasting, we'd say generational, we'd say opportunities for connection, we'd say opportunities to make new spaces, right? And I think neighborhoods kind of live in that function. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, one has come in about ways that, that um, in the Monument Lab, um, projects, you incorporate the intangible pieces of commemoration, for example, music, uh, and how those and how those non the intangible pieces kind of amplify the the meaning. Yeah, I I think for me, I'm never looking for as a curator like the one monument that's going to fix things or the one answer. It's always about the ensemble. It's always about the collective because you know, when you see a monument in a city, part of its power or part of why you ignore it and walk by it every day is because it's in conversation with all other forms of public art, public architecture, public space. So I think about that and for if we do a project for every one big sculpture or one big art installation that will kind of command people's eye, um, it makes room for the ephemeral, the poetic. The, and, and it's important because sometimes that's the best way to reveal what is actually there. I think about the Project Sweet Chariot with the artist Marisa Williamson, which is an augmented reality tour you can take in Old City that uses the traces of African-American history in public space, a small plaque in Washington Square, a mural um, on South Street, and uses it to layer a, a whole kind of like outdoor museum slash um, kind of like performance piece over the spaces that you could walk by every day and kind of miss those. I think about Ursula Rucker's epic Ode to Philly, which if you've never heard it, you can, you can go on the Monument Lab website and hear it. And it's been amazing that past the exhibition, pardon me, past the exhibition itself, Ursula has performed it at the Art Museum. Ursula has performed it at the American Friends um, uh, uh, Center on Cherry Street when hundreds of, of artist activists came to Philadelphia um, for a conference. And um, one of these days, we're going to make a music video for it. It's like been this anthem. And I think it reminds us about the power of art doesn't have to be permanent. You don't need um, something that takes years and years to build, to fundraise, to inscribe, to make meaning in a city. You can stand up. You, so I think making space for that is really important. And making space in our knowledge of what a city is, is and in that as well. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna let you choose the last question. Here, here are two. The first one is, can you tell us about any organizations um, that you collaborate with? That's option A and option B is, what about the Rocky statue? Okay. Okay, so first of all, I wanna, I'm gonna answer both um, quickly. Um, I think um, just um, in, um, in Philly, an organization that we're working with that we adore. If you don't know them, um, you should. And if you know them, come, 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 you know, kind of increase your support as the Village of Arts and Humanities. We're doing a big project um, that launches May 1st, 2021 called Staying Power. And the village's story over many generations of Philadelphia um, is just fantastic. So I just encourage um, uh, the village as one place. Um, and then I'd say our, our fellows. Um, you can learn more about them. One of them is based in Philadelphia. Arielle Brown is a dramaturg and the founder of Black Spatial Relics, um, but also this group of people from Richmond, Virginia, LA, um, uh, and now we have uh, several based in Canada and Mexico um, and Germany. So I just think like getting to know those folks, they are independent. Um, they work on the kind of one foot in institutions and one foot out, and they are fantastic people to get to know. You can get to know them more at Town Hall. Last thing I'll say about Rocky, um, I, I want to write a biography of the Rocky statue. Um, and um, it's, be, it's because I started working on it this year. And then the thing I read to you happened. Um, earlier this year, right as the pandemic was like 
about to be tomorrow's news, um, I, did, I went to observe the Rocky statue and kind of start to write about it. And um, in within 10 minutes, I saw um, visitors who were lined up, you know, as you know, every day, no matter what. And within 10 minutes, saw someone um, raise a black power fist of empowerment and another person hold up the white power symbol of white nationalism. And I thought, like, where else in America are you seeing that? Um, well, it's playing out in our political spheres and sectors, but there's something about the Rocky statue. He's the most famous Philadelphian who never lived. He's the patron of the, uh, patron saint of the underdog. Um, I've known, I think Rocky's um, placement uh, ob uh, obscures in many ways the stories of black boxers like Joe Frazier, um, uh, who ran up the art museum steps before the figure Rocky did. And then I also speak to people time and again um, who've used the art museum steps and the Rocky kind of rituals as a way for empowerment. Um, we had a group of young black women activists from a long walk home, an organization in Chicago I'm on the board of. They came to Philadelphia in 2016. They had never seen Rocky, but the one thing they wanted to do was run up the steps um, as a sign that they had like climbed a mountain, that they were part of their kind of, kind of their pilgrimage to Philadelphia. Um, it was more important than seeing the Liberty Bell and the, and, you know, the Independence Hall. So I, I want to hold that complexity, but I want to think about, I want us all to think about how a mythic working class hero, the stories of racism and the stories of coalition converge at that site um, in very complex ways. Thank you. What a great note to end on. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us this morning. And thank you so much, Paul, for being here and, and giving us a lot to think about. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, hopefully we keep in contact. And you know, you can do that by following at monument underscore lab or joining our mailing list. And um, one of these days, we'll be back together in, in public space. But for now, it's great to connect here. <laughs>